Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Linda Craner. I'll be chairing this session. And I'd like, first of all, to welcome all those of you who are here in the hall and also to the 50 or so people that are currently listening online. In this session, as you know, we have two invited speakers, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Malcolm Reid, Chief Executive of the Joint Information Systems Committee, JISC in the UK, and Josie Fraser, who's IT, ICT Strategy Lead for Leicester City Council. We're going to start with um, Dr. Reid's talk, and Malcolm is going to be talking to us today about um, just support for learning, teaching in a changing educational environment. Malcolm, as I said, is Executive Secretary of JISC, and he's strongly involved in driving policy and strategy development in the use of digital technology in post-16 education and research. He's also Chairman of the European Networking Policy Group, and he was awarded an OBE in 2010. So I look forward very much to hearing Malcolm's talk. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Linda. It's always encouraging, isn't it, that there's more people um, coming in through the internet than actually here, because that's the way it's meant to be, although personally I would never wish to miss an opportunity to travel to, uh, to Yorkshire and to Leeds, and indeed I will be talking a bit about uh, Leeds in a, in a minute. I've got an awful lot of slides to cover, so I will race through. I assume the down arrow does the trick. Yes. Um, I'll very briefly mention the review of the JISC and, and its outcomes, because I think you might appreciate a, an update on that. It will certainly mean uh, quite significant changes to the JISC in, in years to come. Uh, then I'll race through a sort of a catalogue of some of our current um, or new activities that I think are, would be relevant for ALT um, audience. And then I want to talk a little more expansively about open policies and about how even in these current difficult times I think universities and colleges should seriously consider their um, uh, strategic and policy approaches towards the broader open agenda. But first, I, let me take you back to 1906, which I guess not many of you will remember too well, um, because that was the year, the first year of graduation from Leeds University, and it also happens to be a year which has quite a bit of similarities uh, with our current uh, predicament. It was about to go into a double-dip recession. There were uh, riots in London, uh, the, the brown... A dog affair was to do with vivisection, so that was quite interesting that that was a topic that caused riots at, at the time. Um, uh, developments in distance learning, uh, even then. But despite the rather difficult economic period in 2006, two significant acts uh, that you might consider uh, socially progressive, certainly um, certainly very much in keeping with the Open Movement, the Open Spaces Act, and the, um, uh, I'm sure it's, oh, the Education Provision of Meals Act, the Free School Meals. Um, and that's the Charter for Leeds, which actually was therefore founded in uh, 1904. Um, and you'll see that in its way, it represents an, a form of open university at the time, along with universities like Manchester and Edinburgh and a number of others. They were making university uh, places available that, in a sense, were rather more open than the traditional Oxbridge places, which is all that was available before. So, I, so the idea of openness in higher education it goes back, in fact, well into the 19th century. But let me actually um, move on a bit to the GIST review. And I just want to very briefly uh, update you. 
The review was carried out by Sir Alan Wilson, who used to be the Vice Chancellor of Leeds, I think, back, uh, back in the 90s. Its principal recommendation, uh, the purpose of the review was partly to give the funding councils assurance that the GISC was a good thing, that we weren't running off with the money to South America and, and, and so forth, um, but rather more constructively, perhaps, looking at ways that the GISC can change to meet the changing HE environment, or certainly the changing HE funding environment um, in England. I, I know it's uh, somewhat different in Scotland. But that was, that was a big driver. So how the GISC should be, can be, um, could be shaped to uh, be appropriate for what I, I think we have to see as an increasingly private sector uh, HE provision. So its principal recommendation was that we should become a, a separate legal entity and various uh, uh, simplifications and, and rationalizations. For some reason that I can't quite understand, when people from outside uh, the GISC look at the things we do, they, they, tend, to, they tend to feel that uh, we're a somewhat uh, complicated organization. I've no idea why. Um, I personally really quite enjoy the complexity, but there we are. So there were a number of uh, key recommendations, which the funding councils, and, and of course we are part of the funding council structure, any change to our governance and so forth, will uh, those um, changes will be made by the funding councils. They hold the final say. There were sort of three recommendations that they weren't prepared to um, agree to without more evidence. So we have recently got three consultancies underway. Uh, the first one is looking at governance models. What kind of organisation uh, could it just become? Issues here about tax implications, about uh, charity law, for instance, if it became a charity, would that be restrictive, would that not be restrictive? Can we have a governance model such that the ownership of the new GIS can change to reflect uh, changing uh, funding routes? Um, so the second recommendation was about how more of the GIS funding would have to come from the community for the services uh, we provide. Um, I, I think if you look at that within the HEFKE, within the HE England context, that's fairly inevitable. Their learning and teaching grant, which is where the GISC budget comes from, um, is falling over the next four or five years from £7 billion to um, not much over £1 billion, I think. Um, so, and although they could still uh, fund uh, the GISC from the £1 billion, because um, enormously expensive though you might think we are, you still get quite a lot of change out of a billion if you fund the GISC. But nonetheless, the government, of course, are giving, uh, the, giving the funding councils a very clear uh, instructions about where that billion should go. And, it, and in particular, it's there to help subsidise those courses that would cost a great deal more than 9000 a year, for instance, to, to provide medicine and uh, engineering and a lot of the sciences. Um, so as Hefke's ability to fund the GISC, uh, and we are more or less totally uh, funded by the Funding Council, as the Funding Council's ability to, to fund the GISC falls, then we have to look to an environment where the community will, itself will have to pay more for our services. But of course, the argument goes, certainly in England, the universities will be raising more money in fees. But this process would have to be phased in. So the second review is looking at our services. It's partly deciding uh, to what extent we should still be providing those services. Remember, one of the recommendations is that we should simplify and rationalize. And so that might mean that we stop doing um, some things. We, we, have separate, uh, we have a separate services portfolio review process we carry out every year. So we tend to have a, a fairly good handle on what our services are doing and, and how they need to change. And, whether they're still relevant and so forth. But the review is also looking at whether our services should become part of, should in effect uh, be merged into the GIS, which services would, where, would that make sense and, and in which cases, which cases would it not. Uh, so that's a particularly important strand. And then there's also a review of Janet itself. Janet is where um, a little less, some 40 odd percent of our funding a little less than half, 40% of our funding goes. It's, 
It is a very expensive network. It's a very highly valued network, but then there are certain um, technology changes in the network field. We have to look in terms of um, where Janet the network can go, uh, given that uh, funding becomes more constrained, and given that the community itself, certainly in some years' time, will end up having to pay more for the cost of Janet. So we have to have a fairly fundamental review to ensure it's fit for purpose. So a new GISC has to reflect the different funding environment that HE is already finding itself in, but will of course uh, be very much, uh, be a very different kind of funding environment once student fees kick in, uh, and certainly once we're into the process of three years worth of student fees and central funding uh, falling. So, you know, we've, we've got to be more agile, we've got to be more customer focused. After all, we are part of a, the funding structure at the moment um, and, and not really so used to getting funding in from the people that we provide the services to. Uh, none of our services, incidentally, are compulsory. A, a, a university doesn't have to be connected to Janet, for instance. But as Janet is virtually free, it's a little unsurprising that every university is. How can we maintain the integrity of a single integrated network when it, uh, when it won't be um, as relatively cheap as it is at the moment? The HE sector only pays about 10 to 15 percent of the cost of Janet in HE. The FE sector um, at the moment uh, gets a certain minimum bandwidth, 100 meg, I think. Uh, for free and only pays for additional bandwidth on top. So there are different uh, funding models even within our current arrangements. But let me move on to some of our programs. So there's sort of a catalogue, as it were, of a few programs I think might interest you. Uh, this one is perhaps more of interest to some uh, to people in, in administration. It's about moving, uh, enabling course data to move around particularly data that describes courses, part of the marketing activities of a university. And we're not, um, we're working with UCAS and HESA on this project. We're not interested, we're not particularly involved with the UCAS courses, that is the rather traditional uh, ones. We're looking at how to improve the marketing uh, information that universities provide for distance learning courses, uh, online learning courses, uh, which at the moment are predominantly postgraduate. So there's some, uh, so there's a program there. I won't say too much about them because if they do interest you, then of course you look at our website and and you will uh, learn probably more than you want to. Um, now the GIST transformation program is phase two of something that we used to call building capacities program, which some of you may have come across. We recognised a year or two ago that. There's an awful lot of um, resources available to universities, not just from the GISC, but, but, but to help them um, exploit IT, which universities simply don't know about. It's not, you know, it's not that they're reluctant to use them, it's just that they, um, uh, various movers and shakers and the people who do the real work in universities tend not to know about the full range of activities available. So this project is very small sums of money, uh, but very small sums of money if you like to stimulate uh, universities to look, uh, look rather more deeply and carefully at what is available. You might feel that that money shouldn't be necessary, but we experience tells us that it is. Now, our discovery program is something that I think has some... Um, uh, this is principally to do with helping people find online resources uh, that might have been digitised online resources that have been procured one way or another from uh, publishers, for instance, and we, as you, as you might know, certainly have used a lot of capital funding over the years to acquire such resources. It's often very difficult to find them. So this is a programme more to improve finding tools. Now, although it's aimed at those kind of, what you might term, uh, large data sets, bibliographic data, library type uh, resources quite often, It does seem to me that we need to do much more work in discoverability areas in terms of um, online educational resources as well. But I'll get onto that a little uh, in, a, in a few minutes. 
Um, this is a set of um, a set of programs about digitising or making available uh, broader amounts of content. As I say, we have done, spent a lot of money in this area, mostly capital funding. Capital funding is now getting much, much harder uh, to get. So I, I do fear that our ability to add um, online content from capital resources might might become rather limited. But nonetheless, we've still got a uh, we've still got a content program running at the moment. And those are some of the details to look at. The um, OER program, which incidentally is not technically uh, a GIST program, it's a hefty program which the GIST and HEA jointly jointly manage, is now moved into its third year, so we're enormously pleased that a program uh, of work, which I think was considered relatively high risk a couple of years ago, um, was seen as something that we knew that there were definite enthusiasts in the community about open education resources, but some real concerns that it would become uh, generic and, and really uh, catch on more broadly across universities. It clearly has done. Many academics uh, will do it. I, there's not too many universities, in fact, I'm not entirely sure there's any universities that mandate open educational resources across the whole university. Are there? Amber will know. Maybe departments are getting close, aren't they? But yeah, but not, not whole universities, no. Um, and I do think that that's an issue, and I'll come to that in a minute, that um, university management should look at. So we, we have, I'm pleased to say, got, um, got a, a third year of funding. It's um, still around, it's still four million pounds. Uh, it's still a hefty only programme, I'm afraid, so it's not, um, it's not available in, uh, in the other countries. Uh, but there, there's, uh, there's more details there. And there's just been a call out where I, I gather we've had something like 25 bids, so I suspect there'll be a fair few disappointed people, but... How many? Three minutes, okay. Um, I'll skip that slide, I think, because... Um, um, but I do now want to move on to um, some arguments about why universities should consider open, open more broadly than just open educational resources, making, um, for instance, uh, learning outcomes available uh, openly as, as part of the course, generally trying to give students um, a much better understanding of the academic experience they're going to let themselves in for, and, and also link it up with the open access environment in the research community, uh, which is a big movement to make uh, research papers available. We should be able to link those two activities together. In particular, universities should be able to make common um, uh, uh, common policies, whereas at the moment I, I don't think we see that happening uh, too much. It's still very much left at departmental level and not institutional level. I, I had got some slides about copyright um, and about how um, a Mark Twain is partly an excuse to get to get a, a little witticism by Mark Twain at the top of the slide, um, uh, and also the fact that um, he was. Um, he was trying to protect his copyright back in 1906, which is the, which is the year we're focused on here. Um, it turned out, because he wanted, he thought that maybe he could protect copyright and get income for his estate for about 50 years. It turns out that um, the University of, uh, of California, uh, uh, sorry, the I mean it's the publishing uh, University of California publishers um, own the rights now. And they managed, through a little quirk in the Copyright Act, to produce uh, microfilm versions, microfilm versions, which were then bought, and that changed the format. Therefore, the copyright could start all over again. I cannot imagine that that was what the um, legislators of the original Copyright Act back in 1906 actually had in mind. And it's much the same in this country, and that's why the Hargreaves report is particularly important. There's a, a, lot of, um, a lot of effort from JISC and the British Library has gone into um, trying to persuade the government and, and, and certainly the who set up the Hargreaves report and Hargreaves himself and the panel 
to look at a much broader set of IPR restrictions to help in areas, for instance, such as uh, text mining, data mining, which at the moment you could not, you cannot feasibly do, uh, because if any um, owner of a journal wishes to, uh, publisher of a journal wishes to block, block it from text mining, then the text mining tools cannot go into that resource. And quite a lot of useful exemptions for archiving and a number, number of other areas. I'll, I'll let you look through them. Rather a busy slide, so you might want to check on our website because we've got a, a few pages devoted to Hargreaves because this really does matter. And what really matters is that although the government has accepted the Hargreaves recommendation, it's still got to be brought into law. So there's still quite a lot of work to be done. So coming to my uh, final point, um, which I think is to, uh, and we, we, we want to encourage the senior management of institutions to consider the policy issues about openness um, across their institution at a much more strategic level. It's about marketing, it's about helping students have a better understanding of the experience they'd be letting themselves in for, the academic experience. It's about knowledge transfer and promoting uh, particularly uh, research outcomes. Uh, we do find that you know, some universities, some departments have, have the view that their content is, is of value, and some content, of course, is, but it would have to be enormously sophisticated content uh, to be saleable as such, particularly given how much uh, content is already openly available, uh, huge resources, of course, from the Open University in Open Learn. Um, and, and also, if the charter of, of your university, and many universities' charters are, to provide education more broadly than to just the students you take in, this is an important way of meeting uh, that, that requirement. And I'm told I've run out of time, which I think is okay, because that was my last slide. And now I think I can take questions, is that right? Yes, we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, to ask if you're wishing to ask a question, could you remember to say who you are and where you're from? And uh, we'll also take some questions from our, our online listeners and watchers as well. Do we have questions from the board? Bill of the University of Bolton. Um, in terms of uh, the universities starting to increasingly fund JISC out of their resources, is there a disincentive for people to fund the innovation side? Because presumably the results of innovation will be available to everyone, regardless of whether or not they contribute. Yeah, I don't think we see, as it stands at the moment, that innovation would be funded by uh, by the universities. I think they're only really going to be prepared to pay for the services that are delivered, and Janet obviously um, quite a lot of library services as well. Um, but I, I think we would expect um, subscriptions to cover some of our advisory services and, and, and things like that. But, I, but I, personally, I feel that the innovation would have to be funded, by, uh, funded centrally by people who had the national strategic interest rather than the institutional interest in mind. Apart from anything else, you'd be a, um, a brave university who put money into a pot in the hope that you'd get uh, something out of it. Um, so I, I, it is the services that we were thinking of. Any more questions from the floor? Yeah, one up here. Yeah, David White, University of Oxford. Um, there's something going on about in terms of um, universities that charge higher fee rates have to be seen to be um, engaging with the world in different ways as part of their sort of responsibility. Uh, is, is the, what the wide, the widening access. Widening access, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. Um, where do you see JISC 
in that context and against sort of what you were talking about in terms of openness? Is that something that JISC is going to be getting involved in? Well, I, I don't think... Um, uh, I mean, our remit, of course, essentially is tied to the technology. But openness, of course, can certainly help uh, try to address concerns that students from those, um, uh, those areas of society which traditionally think of university not for the, not, it's not for the likes of us. If, if they're bright, um, in the sixth form, for instance, um, I believe they should be given ready access to the kind of academic and scholarly materials they would be exposed to at university. And they might well find that it isn't so daunting um, after all. Um, let's face it, if you're expected to be able to read a scientific paper in the autumn um, of one year, then I suspect you could probably cope in the spring as well. As uh, uh, Now, how many students you may or may not feel would be motivated to do that? Well, actually, if you come from Oxford, you don't really, of course, deal with students who'd be motivated to do that. But well, I guess that remains to be seen. But if you can't make the material available to entice them in the first place, uh, then clearly, clearly they, they do take a, a leap in the dark, especially out of thought if they want to go in for a subject that's not even taught at A-level. I mean, how do you really know if you're, um, what would it be, 18 or something, what accountancy is like or what law is like or what dentistry is like? I've never worked out why anybody would go in for dentistry. But <laughs> <laughs> We have uh, a couple of questions from our online listeners, so I'm going to pass over to James. The, the first one is from Philip Butler, um, who's asking, the, the leadership presentation suggested senior management was still largely out of touch, and he feels the regional support centres have been delivering an excellent service and still have a critical role in sector development, probably FE sector. Does Malcolm see JISC supporting RSCs in the future? Oh, yes. Yes, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's unambiguously the case. The, the RSCs um, are very highly regarded across the FE sector. Um, they do an enormously good job of actually getting into the colleges and addressing the problems within the institution. Much harder uh, to do in, in HE, but in many ways, we do want the new GIST um, particularly to do more embedding work, get within the institution more. So the building, oh, sorry, uh, it used to be called the Building Capacities Programme, it's now called the Transformation Programme, which I mentioned in one of the slides. That is very much designed to put people inside an institution to help them find resources. I mean, I guess the take up there is, is like, uh, the, the enthusiasm is likely to be greater at the smaller universities in the first instance, but, but we see real potential. But we can't, so the question is not so much, are we committed to the RSCs in FE? We are. The question is, how can we get a similar degree of engagement within institutions in HE? I think we've got time for a very, a very short final question. If anyone has any burning issues that they would like to overhear, Tom. Thank you. Tom Franklin, Franklin Consulting. Um, there used to be the Computers and Technology Initiative, then there was the HEA had subject centres and they provided information to institutions. With their demise, do you see their sort of scope for JISC to take on some of that role, perhaps reinvent the CTIs and do some really helpful, supportive work in institutions? Um, well, probably not. I think the, the Wilson Review, uh, when it talked about us having to prioritise um, and, and rationalise and simplify and, and, and all that, generally be neater and tidier uh, than we are. Um, they, the review did provide guidance about the kind of activities that we should focus on, and, and there the emphasis was put on things that have a, a, a generic impact across an institution rather than specifically related to uh, one or more disciplines. So, you know, but I mean, obviously Janet falls into that category. A lot of work on, on admin, help supporting admin systems would fall into that category. Uh, library materials does in, in aggregate. Um, I can't.
can't see that in our current funding position we would be in a position to support um, individual disciplines in the way that the subject centres did. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, I think of all, for all the people who've been watching, just to think as it evolves to see what happens in the future, it's a very interesting stage for all of us. So can you join me please in thanking Malcolm for his interesting...